Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel Science to Technology. In today's show, Science Thursday, we're going to talk about dynamic electrical grid. So let's dive right into it. Now, what exactly is the problem? We have an electrical grid and does work. So what's the problem? Well, problem is that electricity is becoming far more important in our day-to-day -day life than it used to be. Meaning if in 1800s you lost power, not a big deal. 1900, uh, minor inconvenience. Now, uh, lethal. So fundamentally, the importance of electricity is very high right now, meaning it's not something that can be turned off. Even in India, even though we have really bad uh, uptime, we still have electricity. We still have like, okay, we can uh, run our water pumps every day so we can fill our tanks and uh, things like that. So we need it. It's not optional. It's not luxury. It's compulsory. Then uh, you have to understand one tricky aspect of electricity. Electricity is non-storable, meaning you can't just like, okay, I'm going to store it. I'm going to produce it and then I'm going to store it. It does not work that way. So if you are turning on a microwave, let's say, that 700 watt of energy that it just consumes, let's say one uh, unit of energy, it was just made around 30 to 50 milliseconds ago. Just again, like again, if you let's say have a huge uh, metal furnace that's gonna like consume let's say 10 megawatts of power. Yeah, there are furnaces that are that big. And at that point in time, where did that 10 megawatt came from? The moment you turn it on, it would have put a load. Now that load would have magnetically coupled from uh, like you know your uh, equipment to transformer, transformer to substation, substation to uh, another substation to distribution substation to uh, transmission substation to that generator. Now that what would have happened there? Energy cannot be created nor destroyed. Now you are extracting so much out of it it would have started to slow it down now why it did not just like stop like a magnetic break well reality is mass for example a giant turbine uh, generator system could have spinning mass like uh, the rotor of that generator could be huge heavy as in like 100 ton plus then you are talking about steel shaft that could be big heavy and then you are talking about turbines so grand total the amount of mass that is spinning that could be huge you are talking around 100 uh, hundreds of ton so again you're gonna have high pressure you have medium pressure then low pressure so like some serious amount of pressure is there um, mass is there now if you apply that kind of break electromagnetic breaking where it's like i'm gonna put extra 30 megawatt load on you you know it will start to slow down but it will not slow down instantly because inertia so now that inertia gives you time. What is that time? That simply means your RPM, let's say it's spinning at 1500 RPM, your uh, monitor, uh, monitoring algorithm, computer, analog computer, whatever it is there, it's gonna look at that. It's like, I'm saying life is good, everything is good. It's like, hey, wait a minute, 1500, it went down to 1499. It's like, hmm, I'm paying attention. 1498, hmm. Now I'm serious. 1497, okay, open up the steam valve. That means there is load on it. It starts to slow down, but that buffer time is to, uh, enough there for computer to take over it and be like, okay, open the valves, increase the steam pressure. Now your generator is maintaining the RPM. Now, same thing happens in reverse when you turn it off, meaning your RPM is like uh, rotating at 1500 RPM. You remove the load. Let's say you turn off your furnace. That again, this should spin up. It will spin up, but it will give you time. The computer can look at it just like, everything is good, 1500, 1500 watt, whoa, 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 whoa. why it's 1503 now? Okay, it's going to 1505, okay, shut down the valve. It will throttle it down, it's like, relax, brother, relax. Energy cannot be created, not destroyed. Now that buffer zone is very narrow nowadays. Like if you uh, have a frequency meter, you can look into power lines and you if like 50 Hertz, point, to 001 49.0035 it's like very refined like the amount of refinement we have on frequency right now, that's how the rpms are controlled so energy that you are consuming is directly coming from that so grid are generally try to be tied together meaning even if you have a nation where you can have like multiple sex sub segments you will try to tie it down now tying it down does give you uh, basically stability meaning if you have excess power drop because again i did specify that you can increase the power output but does not mean a six 100 megawatt generator can like you know magically start to provide 700 megawatt it generally would be running at like 600 plant would be running at let's say 500 it has a little bit of plus and minus and again you will not want it to run at 100 percent capacity all the time you will be like okay close enough like you know there would be optimum zone based on the cooling outdoor temperature all that jazz you will have a reason where it's like you know i can up it down or tone it down or maybe it's just a raw base load system where it's like just either it's on off uh, nuclear plants are like that so in those sort of scenarios, you do want some buffer, external things that can buffer it out. Like, hey, that plant is like, you know, doing up and down, I'm going to consume that excess energy. Other plants are like, too damn deficit, I'm going to sell energy to it. So it does give you stability if you bind all those things together, but it makes you vulnerable to faults. Meaning, if you have fault in one, it can cascade failure because again, generators have safety equipments tied to it, which are like, if over voltage happens, uh, over current happens, it's just like, 
cuts it off. It's like, no, I shall save this multi-million dollar equipment because again, if this equipment gets damaged, the cost would be exponentially higher. It's not just that generator, the amount of energy loss, to, uh, like for example, every factory that will lose uh, productive hours, it's exponential. So it's like, let's cut it off. It's far more acceptable. So it does make you vulnerable. Now, supply and demand must be matched. That uh, turbine thing, there are people who are managing it. But there are other, they have uh, basically peaker power plants that are like on call. It's like, hey, 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 dude, the RPM is going down too much. We can't just uh, provide enough power. Turn on the peaker plant. There are like people whose job it is to like manage all these things. And it's a matter of national security. For example, let's say Russia gets its ass kicked in uh, Ukraine. They're like, we're gonna take uh, your buildings. Uh, there is no actual point. Okay, now we're gonna take your power plant. That does have a... <laughs> That, that is painful. Like again, you could you could use a hypersonic missile to blow out a building. It's like, sir, you spent $100 million to knock down something that is $2 million. It's not point useful. But again, this is useful. So that's the whole point. It is significant, important. We have to upgrade this puppy. So how we can improve it? Well, first thing is smart grid. Now this is on the consumption side of things. This is on the consumption end. Now modern tech does allow interconnection. We from like as early as 1970, we could build technology that allows us to control things, uh, relays, uh, contactors, things of that nature. We got that, that part is sorted. But we did not have the technology where we can collapse all that data into one central point and observe it and crunch it through it. Basically, you could not have a scenario where it's like, okay, every household has like, you know, uh, grid subdivided as in like, these are heavy loads. Let's say your jet pumps, uh, your water heater, your air conditioner, your refrigerator, then it has sub loads that are like, uh, you know, uh, your fans, lightings, then you have luxury loads, like let's say TV, computers, things of that nature. That can be done today. It's very easy because of the development of modern technology, specifically IT related technology. That is now a basic bitch stuff to do. Then you have to understand, I'm not talking about shutting down things to save energy. If you are just a bit wiser how you turn it on and off, that itself saves a lot. I'm not talking about hey, nobody should use air condition. Use it, no problem with that. Just little bit of wisdom to it. For example, uh, back in the days in India, if you bought any stabilizer that we used to buy, have to still have to buy, it's just like when we buy a stabilizer, it was like turn on, it turns on. Now modern stabilizers that you can buy, it will generally have a timer. It's like five to 10 second timer. It's like, it's gonna count down, then it turns on the system. Because every time you turn on a, a heavy load like that, there is serious inrush current. Uh, sometimes it's because of the capacitor, sometimes it's because it's directly connecting induction motor. So there's serious inrush to that. Now, if you have that inrush, what if you just delay it? Meaning Okay, house number one, have your inrush load. Okay, tuck. Okay, five millisecond later, inrush happened, transformer heated up, you just like let it cool down, then okay, next five seconds. Everything is awesome. Everything awesome. Just doing that, just phasing things out, just, you know, gapping the uh, inrush system can extend the life of transformer exponentially. So this sort of, just turning it off and on wisely. Think of it this way, let's say you have water heaters. It's like, hey, everybody turns on their water heater in the morning. It's like, that's stupid. Let's turn on all the water heaters at night. And again, do it step by step. It's like uh, from 9 uh, a.m. to uh, 10, 9 p.m., basically 9 p.m. to 11 p.m., this block. Uh, 10 p.m. to other 11 p.m., this block. You are doing that. And then you are running a backup heater that is like generally very small watt, uh, 15 watt heater that is just making sure the out outbound heat, meaning if you heat up the water tank to full extent, it still leaks energy. Now that energy has a rating, meaning it could be losing around 15 watt or 20 watt. Then you will have a small heater there just like stabilizing it. Just like that will run continuously. And that's a very small load. It will not cause inrush or like, you know, large load on the system just by doing that. So every morning you won't have that spike current. It's like everybody is calm down. We have hot water, relax, enjoy. Just with wisdom. I'm not talking about technology, modern technology, just with wisdom. It's like, let's have a look at things. That's why on consumption side, we have a lot of potential of optimization. Reducing peak time load is also desirable because whenever peak time is triggered, peaker power plants are turned off and those plants are dirty. As in like CO2 emissions of those puppies are dirty. CO2 per uh, kilowatt hour is very high. Then we also come to pollutants. Those are also very highly polluting because uh, coal power plant has enough luxury to like have enough oomph to it. Whereas like, yeah, I'm making millions of dollars. I can spend time, money, energy, location, all that jazz for making sure I have flu glass treatment. These things not supposed to come on 24 into seven. So they generally do not have that kind of monetary budget. And consequence, it's a feedback loop. It becomes uh, the per unit of electricity from these sort of plant is much expensive compared to base load plants. So we can shave it off just by turning it on and off wisely, everything wisely. So this sort of smart meter is a basic commodity item now. It's like back in 1980s, it was like, whoa, magic. Now it's like, who cares? 
just smart management can save capacity meaning majority of our grid would be relaxed state that also allows us buffer state meaning if you have a very serious fault that puts a lot of strain if your grid is not maxed out all the time it's like i can absorb it i can like i got this i got this if everything is maxed out all the time minor fault is like your whole sector went poof so that's why this is on the consumption side if we have good smarts we can make it wiser then we come to the hvdc links now this is on transmission end now transmission you have to understand dc is better for energy it's like whoa, 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 whoa. what about edison tesla here's the sole reason edison one uh, uh, lost basically is that because tesla figured out one thing you shall increase the voltage in order to transmit awesome here's the how do you increase voltage on dc you can't like practically speaking we still can't uh, and you're like what about dc dc boost converter yeah it's not it's ac look at like pro point you're like okay it's, it's pulsing on and off on and off again and again so inherently if you want to use a transformer you have to use ac that's why we use ac is because it's very cheap to transform meaning you just generator in power plants does not produce like gigawatts of uh, voltage it's, it's not like you know 12 giga uh, volt uh, output why because again the copper has insulation around it so it does not start out now if the higher the voltage the thicker the insulation so thicker the insulation less space you have for copper less magnetic coupling efficiency so voltage is limited in generator by again uh, there is always a trade off you do not want too low voltage because if you have too low voltage the heat output of current would be too high so you always try to balance it out like between the current uh, production between heat production all that between cooling everything you balance it out that it creates a scenario where you have let's say 11 kv generators which are producing at 11 kv that kv goes to a transformer transformers like yeet now that yeet it to very high level like 500 kv or 800 kv or 1200 ultra high kv yeah there are something that are that bonkers that's why you use ac because we can just do it we can just like feed in uh, 11 kv and just like eat 1200 kv out of it then that 1200 kv can be transmitted very long range and then at that other end you can be like hey hey chill down chill chill bro chill uh, then you can chill it down from 1200 to 100 and then sub distribute it to substations and those substations is like hey chillax brother we then you go to 11 kv then 11 kv comes in house household next to you the transformer next to you and that transformer is like relax brother i got you relax you have tone it down to let's say 110 volts or in case of india 120 volts that's the sole reason we use ac it's not that ac is good ac is really bad because if you talk to any engineers like hey i want to transmit power 1000 kilometer and you say that you want to use ac they're like this guy skipped school you cannot use it for AC for that. It's flat out not meant for long range transfer. 100 kilometer, good. 500 kilometer, pushing it. 800 kilometer, forget about it. It's simply not going to work. Why? Capacitance loss and skin effect. Meaning your conductor is inherently much smaller than you think. And that's why you, whenever you look at transmission line, you will always find they have multiple smaller conductors rather than one fat cable. Why? Again, skin effect makes it useless. The core conductor will be useless. So, and capacitance loss, it's basically the world is acting like a capacitor for it so inherently you cannot bury these lines also again that's why you will not never see this sort of line buried you can do uh, bury line for short duration there are places where they have to cross it a river or in some scenarios they will do that but only for short uh, distance otherwise it will simply heat up too much or lose very significant amount of energy so if you have to travel far you have to travel underground you have to use HVDC, which is high voltage direct current. Now that direct current allows you to connect what we call offshore wind farms. Those wind farms, the moment they cross 80 kilometer in terms of distance, they're like, okay, throw away the AC substation, put a HVDC link there. You have no other choice. Otherwise the seawater will simply sap away all your electricity. You have to do it. That's why I specified DC is much better for transmission. It's just that making it that high voltage still requires us to use transformer. The moment we use, like these are uh, China's uh, highest power system, which is around 12 kVA, around 12 gigawatt capacity. So this is one phase transformer, like wait a minute, why has two prongs? Uh, the systems are designed in such a way that they take three phase output, uh, basically input, three phase input from the generator. They make it six phase output. Uh, so basically it's connected uh, one coils are connected in delta another coil is collected in y and voila you put three in you get six out voila 
and that's how we transmit that. Then this 12 kV AC goes into converter stations. That converter station makes it into DC and then you can transmit it to yellow. How do you know that DC is transmission? If you only find two lines or a single line, it could be a monopole transmission. Uh, you can find that. If you are finding things in multiples of three, that's a normal AC system. If you are finding multiples of two, uh, that's a DC system. Generally, two one will generally only have two conductors. There's no point of having like, you know, four or six or eight. So they generally you will find two. That means that's a DC system. It allows long range energy saving, meaning if you're transmitting power 100 kilometer, uh, you will lose 6% in AC line. In DC line, you will lose only 3%. So if you're transmitting a very large connection, for example, China has 12 gigawatt system. India has around uh, eight gigawatt system, which is, let me load that puppy. Ha, Northeast Agra station, that is in India's largest interconnect. And at the time of its construction, which was in 2016, it was world's only tri-link connection, meaning A, B, and C. Right now, majority of HVDC is A to B. That was the first time A to B to C was connected. And future hope is that everything will be, uh, backbone transmission would be, rather than high voltage AC, would be high voltage DC. It does allow you to bury it, which also saves on land cost and does allow you to run it under the river, under the sea, things of that nature. Majority of European interconnects are HVDC. So that allows large interconnects to be possible. Then your grid can be truly tied up without fault transmission. Meaning if you have 50 hertz on one end, 60 hertz on another, no care, nobody cares. If you have different frequency timing versus this different, nobody cares. That's the benefit of HVDC. That's the core secondary of grid that we have to do. And more and more countries are slowly doing it. Then we come to energy storage. This is the third link. This is on, almost on the generation side because energy cannot be stored inherently. You do can convert it, meaning you can convert it into heat, you can convert it into light, or you can convert it into other things. For example, gravitational potential energy. You can convert it into kinetic energy. You can convert it into electrochemical energy. And you can do back and forth. That's how you can store energy. So pumped hydro is the biggest battery that we know how to build. As in like we have already built this, as in like there are batteries that are like uh, 20 gigawatt hour kind of capacity. That's huge. Like that can run a metropolis for a few hours. Huge. It's like huge. And then we have electrochemical system, which are the fastest because uh, pumped hydro does work. It's amazing thing, known technology. We built it back in the days of a nuclear uh, fever. Everybody had that. Uh, then we built it because nuclear power plant do not like to throttle down. They're like, bro, all time, all output unless they are shutting down a reactor, but generally they'll be like full power all the time. So pumped hydro was created to buffer that output system. So pumped hydro is amazing for that. Uh, then we come to electrochemical. For example, if you want instantaneous power stabilization, rather than having peaker plant, you can have uh, giant gigascale batteries. Like you connect a solar output into those batteries. This battery will give you a buffered output to the outside world. And that scenario you will have like managing things out. I'm gonna like, I got this. You can temper it down. And more and more R&D are done, uh, being done for this sort of system. There are CO2 battery system, cryogenic air energy storage system. There are many, many systems that, let's see uh, which will come out on the top. Because right now, pumped hydro and normal electrochemical system are the top option. One is for quick response. One is for big bulk load. Then we have to understand this will allow us to integrate renewable energy reliably. Then we can have as much renewable as we want if we have big enough batteries. Then we're like, who cares? Who cares about coal prices? Like you do not want to be like China where it's like, uh, Australia, could you please sell us coal for cheap? Australia is saying, no bro, no money. You do not want to be like stuck in like a European scenario where it's like, Russia is like, give us, remove your stuff. It's like, no, like, no, but I will cut the gas. You do not want to be there. That's why you want renewable. You want renewable for independence. If you don't care about the environment, then th sell it that way. It's like, it's about independence. So what is our hope, practically speaking? Our hope is that our grid is inherently very dumb. Inherently, every aspect of our grid is just like, uh, you know, a baby that is now big. We just like built this puppy in 1980s and 1970s and just like, we're just making it bigger. We are not making it wiser, we're just making it bigger. So we have to have multi-vector upgrade path. For example, transmission have to go from AC to DC. Uh, the in, uh, basic consumption in has to become smart. Uh, we have to have energy storage that can buffer renewables properly. All these things will allow us to have a better grid. That will allow uh, our limitations, basically old limitation of old power grid and vulnerability of old power grid to go away. At that point in time, we can reduce our CO2 emission and have a nation that can truly grow. If you ever wondered why the heck India did not grow as exponentially as uh, China. It, it, 
India kind of missteps so in terms of energy production. Like we do have uh, electricity production capacity, it's just that so much electricity is told, stolen, as in like people steal so much electricity, is that we just do not have uptime on our grid. Like there is enough production, there is enough everything, it's just that stealing the power, again power plants do not make their money back, they have to cut production, and then government has to give subsidy, it's a very vicious loop. Thankfully one state did figure it out, that is uh, Gujarat, and no power cuts there. Like. People live in Gujarat, do not know what power cut is. Like there is no inverter shops in Ahmedabad. I was shocked, like I was there for like two, three weeks and like no inverter shops. In, uh, like in my hometown, it's like inverter shop, inverter shop, UPS shop, inverter shop, inverter shop, UPS shop. We have to have it that many. So that's the hope that whole country will have much better, much more robust, much more reliable, less polluting system that is allows us to grow far more efficiently into the future. So this was my presentation on dynamic power grid. Hopefully you have liked it, learned from it. In that case, please click the like button, share it amongst your friends, that will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press dislike, press it twice to show me extra disappointment. Please leave a comment because I do try to reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon if you're free, and as always, thanks for watching.